Welcome Bethany Church to worship today. So glad you are joining in wherever you may be watching. A couple quick announcements I'd like to make before we begin worship. Uh, first, nominating season is continuing. If you have somebody you'd like to nominate for elder or trustee or deacon, we'd love to collect those names and then, um, and then be able to nominate them going into the 2021 year. So if you have a name or somebody or somebody that's on your mind, please send that in. We'd love to collect that. Secondly, we are celebrating the birthdays of both Lorreen Grossen and Elmer Grossen this week. Lorreen turned 92 years old this week, and Elmer turned 98 years old this week as well. So happy birthday to both of them this week. As we begin worship, I'd like to open worship with a, a psalm I've been uh, reading a lot throughout this week, a psalm, a popular one, Psalm 139. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be too dark for you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonder wonderful. I know that full well. Let us join together in worship today.
Let us join together in prayer. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your provision, for your guidance, for your, for your presence when things are joyful and your comfort when things are hard. Lord, when we, when we think of who you are, we are in awe of, of you. We are so inadequate to be in relationship with you. We are so flawed to be in the presence of you, and yet you still call us children. Lord, in this moment of silence, please hear our prayer of confession, the stumbling we, we cause, the, the failings we, we continually create. Lord, please hear our prayer in this moment. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness, for your grace, and for your mercy. Draw us nearer into your presence, Holy Spirit. Let us, let us draw more into an awareness of how near you truly are to us this week. We love you in your name. Amen. Hey!
down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are. As you are. Come as you are. Come as you are. Come as you are. At the beginning of the service, during the announcements, Trevor told you about the birthdays of Lorraine Grossen, who's turning 92, and Almer Grossen, who's turning 98, and we celebrate with them. And that calls to mind the scripture, for me at least, that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and that he watches over our life from the very beginning to the very end. And while we told you about two wonderful celebrations of long lives, at the beginning of the service. Sadly, I have to tell you about someone's death today. On Thursday night, I was called by Nancy Pierce. And by the time that I had gotten to her house, Steve Pierce, sadly, had passed away. He had died. We're not really sure why, at this point, he has died. But we wanted to let you know that. And we wanted to pray for Nancy. And so, will you join with me in prayer? Almighty and gracious God, as I've already said, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the one who watches over our life from the very beginning to the very end. And God, I pray today, and I give you thanks for Steve's life, for the people that he touched during his life. Lord, I thank you for his love, for his wife, and for his daughters. And God, we also thank you for the promise of the resurrection. And Lord, I pray for that promise to wash over Nancy and her daughters right now. I pray that it is something that they can hold on to as they grieve and as they mourn. And Lord God, I pray that his death would be something for all of us to remember in which we give thanks for our life and thanks for the ones around us. Lord God, again, bring your ministering spirit upon Nancy and her children and be with them. I pray this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have been worshiping with us, you know that we are in a sermon series based on Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and 7 letters which were written to seven churches. And you know that we now have come to the sixth church. If you haven't joined us, then we are in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles now to that section of the Scripture. And we're going to put up a map to remind you of where these seven churches are were the cities where they were located in what today we call Turkey, but back then they would have called Asia Minor, so that you have those cities in your mind, because we're going to show you another map a little later on in the message, which doesn't look at cities, but looks at kind of sections or what we might call states of Asia Minor at that time. But hear now the word of the Lord from Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my command 
to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, I thank you for these words written to that church in Philadelphia. And God, even though they were written many years ago, Lord, help us find meaning in them today. Help us to understand what those words mean for us as we live here in the Bethany area in the 21st century, how we might live out the truth that we find in the text. And God, I pray that there would be more of you and less of me in these words that I'm about to preach. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've told you before that I used to live in a town called Vacaville down in California. Some of you may have heard of Vacaville because as you drive down Interstate 5 into California, and if you want to go to San Francisco or areas in the San Francisco Bay Area, at one point, Interstate 5 will turn into Interstate 505, which will then turn into Interstate 80, which will take you into the San Francisco area. But where Interstate 505 joins Interstate 80 is the town of Vacaville, California. So a lot of people in Oregon know about it. Now, when I used to travel outside of Vacaville and outside of California, and people would ask me where I was from, and I'd say, oh, I'm from Vacaville, California. If they knew any Spanish at all, they would look at me and they would say, wait, you actually live in Cowtown? Because while we called it Vacaville, it's better pronounced in the Spanish Vacaville, and Vaca means cow. But it's not a cow town. It never was. There's a different history. But if, again, if I was outside of California, that's what I would get asked. When I traveled from Vacaville inside California, I'd get a different response. Anybody under the age of 50 would say to me, oh, have you ever gone to the outlets there? Because there are stores upon stores upon stores of outlets now in Vacaville. But if the person was over 50, they would then tell me stories about the time that they had stopped at something called the nut tree in Vacaville, California. It was famous for it. It began as just a fruit stand, and then it became a place where you could stop and get something to eat. Uh, there was an airport that was located there, a place for kids to play, a place where you could buy some dried fruit. It became a destination. President Nixon stopped there one time when he was campaigning. It was that well known. And my point is that every city, every place, kind of have its own reputation and its own history. The present-day city of Philadelphia on the east coast of the United States certainly has a history, and it has a reputation. And that city of Philadelphia is named after the city of Philadelphia found here in the book of Revelation. And this city also had a very important history and a background, and it's important for us to understand that history and background in order to get for us to glean as much as we can from these words that are in the text. The city of Philadelphia that is referenced in the book of Revelation, it was the youngest of all of the cities that we've talked about from Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The city of Philadelphia in the book of Revelation was founded in 140 AD. It was founded by colonists 
from the town of Pergamon, a town that we've already covered in the sermon series. It was founded when the leader of Pergamum, a man by the name of Attalus, wanted to establish another city. And Attalus was known for being someone who really loved his brother. And in Greek, the word for someone who really loved their brother was Philadelphos. And so when the colonists came to the new town and they wanted to honor Attalus, he was so well known as being someone who loved his brother, a Philadelphos, that they then named the city Philadelphia. And the city of Philadelphia was placed where it was placed on purpose. You see, the, the city of Philadelphia was a missionary city. And you say the whole city was full of Christians, we would say that if we're in the church, because that's what we mean by missionary. But it wasn't a missionary city in order to disperse Christian theology. No, it was founded as a missionary city of Greek thought, of Greek language, and of Greek culture. You see, Philadelphia was founded basically at the intersection of three districts or three states, and we'll show you a map of this. It was founded at the intersection of the area of a, of a state of Mysia, of Lydia, and Phrygia. And Mysia was a, a Greek-speaking and a Greek-influenced state. And so their job was to be missionaries in Philadelphia to the residents of Phrygia and of Lydia and to give them Greek culture. They were so successful, by the way, that by A.D. 19, so some 160 years later, the people of Lydia, who were not Greek, had forgotten their own language and had begun to speak Greek and didn't remember their own native language. And Greek became their language. There are also some other important aspects of the city of Philadelphia. In A.D. 17, the whole area of Asia Minor was decimated by a massive earthquake. And it destroyed a lot of Philadelphia. And a lot of the other cities began to rebuild originally, but not Philadelphia, because what happened in Philadelphia is there were very strong aftershocks in Philadelphia, very strong tremors which lasted for a long time they were so strong in fact that the residents of philadelphia no longer lived in the city but instead they lived outside of the city in tents they would go into the city during the day because if there was an aftershock and something else fell over or a house caved in or a temple caved in they could see it and they could escape but at night if they were sleeping and there was an aftershock earthquake they wouldn't necessarily know and a building could collapse on them. So they did not live in the city at night. They had tents set up. Again, they would go in the city during the day. They would worship in the temple during the day. But then they would leave it at night. So strong were the aftershocks. And so decimated was the city. Now when the city was decimated like this, the emperor at the time, Tiberius Caesar, wanted to help them rebuild, and so he stopped all their taxes for five years. Wouldn't that be something that's great if we could stop paying taxes for five years? I would appreciate that. And so that's what the Roman emperor did at the time. The citizens of what I guess what we would call the area of Philadelphia were so appreciative of that that they named Philadelphia. They gave it a new name after Tiberius Caesar. They called it Neo Caesarea. This favor to the city con continued under the Emperor Vespasian. And again, the residents of Philadelphia were so grateful for his favor that his family name was Flavius. And so they named the city from Neo Caesarea, they named it Flavius in honor of the emperor, because the emperor was so true to them. 
Now, the city was also founded on the edge of a vast volcanic plain full of old ash, which made it a very fertile plain. And so they grew grapes there, such grapes that would make wonderful wine, wine that even competed with the wine and the grapes that were produced right outside of Rome. Well, they had such favor with the emperors that they changed their names, but eventually that favor ended under the emperor Domitian. And under the emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 AD, about the time that these words were written, during his reign as emperor, he basically became jealous or mad that the grapes of this region rivaled that of Rome. And so he ordered the residents of the area of Philadelphia to rip up all their grapes and destroy all their vineyards. This, of course, would be seen as deceit and betrayal by the emperor. And it was kind of like breaking the backbone of the economy of the area. And it caused them great strife and great trouble. And that truth is revealed in the scriptures, which we'll see in just a moment as Jesus names himself. But the church in Philadelphia, we should also pay attention to it because it's one of two cities which Jesus never said anything negative about the church in that city, so we should pay attention to it. And as we turn and look at the scriptures, in verse 7, Jesus introduces himself with very specific names, as he has done throughout all of the letters. And he says, these are the words of him who is holy. Now, when we think of the word holy, we usually think of something that is pure, as 100%, who never does anything wrong, but the word holy in Greek is the word hagios. And it simply means different. And what Jesus is saying is, I am a different type of Lord. Now, the emperor, Roman emperor, often set himself up as Lord, but Jesus is saying, no, I am a different kind of Lord than the emperor. And I'm different because the next section says that he's true. That's the name he gives himself. And in Greek, there are two words for true. One is when you're saying a true statement is something is true or false. The other meaning of a Greek word for true is something that will continue to be true. Someone or something that will not betray you. And the people of Philadelphia, including the people of the church, had just been betrayed by the emperor Domitian and telling them to tear up their great grapes. And that's why he says he's not only holy, he's different, he's true, and he's not going to betray them. And the people in the church in Philadelphia also, though, we feel like felt betrayed by the Jewish people in Philadelphia because the church originally was headquartered in a Jewish synagogue because most of the people who became Christians, followers of Jesus, were Jewish in their background. And so they would go ahead and go to the synagogue and keep on worshiping in their normal ways that they would just continue to worship Jesus. But eventually this became problematic for Jewish people and they would shut out the Christians from their synagogue. And so Jesus says, no, I'm the one who has the, the key of David, meaning he is the person who is the true Jewish person, who is the true Jewish leader, because David was the ancestor that so many Jews looked to to be their leader. But Jesus is saying, no, I hold that key of David. I am the true leader. And he says, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. We believe this is a reference to how the Jewish people were shutting the doors of their synagogues on the followers of Jesus. And so that's why these words appear there. And then he begins to compliment the church in Philadelphia. He says, I know your deeds. And he tells them that even though they have little strength in verse 8, he says, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. In Greek, there are several tenses. In Greek, this is something in the aorist tense, which means the past tense. So what it means is sometimes in the past, 
the church in Philadelphia, the followers of Jesus in Philadelphia, suffered some kind of persecution, and they were told to deny the name of Jesus. But it says here that they did not do that, that they were faithful, they kept his word, and did not deny his name. And then in verse 10, it says that they endured patiently and kept his command. Now, the words endured patiently in Greek, again, they're in the aorist tense. And so they recall something that happened to them. And as it happened to them, that they endured patiently. Now, the word endured patiently doesn't just mean endured and they, as if they had no hope of change. Instead, it means you endured with a hope with a belief, with an understanding that there was a greater thing to come, that Jesus would bring hope. And that's the difference between just endurance and enduring patiently in the text of always enduring with a hope that is to come. And that hope is so important to keep in mind even when we struggle, even when we have hard work, even when we focus on some things that sometimes can even depress us and make us feel bad. Still, if we have that hope, it helps us to continue on. When I think about that, I think of a woman named Mother Teresa. Now, many of you know the name of Mother Teresa and know her story, but some may not. She was a Roman Catholic nun who, on a visit to India, felt called there to serve the poorest of the poor, those who were diseased, specifically with leprosy. And so she began to serve them and care for them. These people who had leprosy, they were most likely going to die. But Mother Teresa set up a place, a hospital, where they could be cared for and where they could die in dignity. And oftentimes people came to visit Mother Teresa to see the ministry that was going on with her and the fellow nuns who would serve with her. And one time there were some Americans who came to visit with her and to talk with her about what she was doing and to see what she was doing. And she didn't stop just to sit there and talk with them. She just talked with them as she went along her daily duties. And one day her duties were to take care of a person who had leprosy, to take their bandages off, to to clean them, and a, a person who had no fingers and no nose. And after she did that and they kind of left that hospital ward, one of the Americans turned to her and said, Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you do for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa looked back at him and said, Neither would I. Neither would I. She wasn't doing it for the fame. She wasn't doing it for the money. But she was enduring patiently through serving these people, because she had a hope in Jesus Christ and a hope that something better was waiting for these people. And so that's what continued to move her to love these people and to care for them and to live the life that she lived, enduring it, even though it was a hardship for her at times, she did it patiently because she had this hope in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus compliments the church in Philadelphia for their faithfulness and for their patience, for their hope in affliction. And so what happens when we do something well for Jesus? Well, he gives us more work to do. It kind of calls in mind what's known as the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. If you're unfamiliar with that parable, what happens is that A man, a leader, gives three of his servants different amounts of money and he tells them to use it and he goes off and then he comes back. And two of them, the ones who were given the most money, had put it to work in the name of the leader. But the last one did not. And the ones who had more, who were faithful, were then given more at the end of the parable. And the church here in Philadelphia, they had been faithful again. They had been patient in their endurance and their affliction. And so what does Jesus do again? He gives them more to do. We look in verse 8, and this is what their more to do is. He says, see, I have placed before you an open door 
that no one can shut. And what this calls to mind is the open door that the original Philadelphians had to be missionaries of Greek culture and language and thought. And now Jesus is saying he's opening a door for the church in Philadelphia to be missionaries of Jesus Christ to the city and to the surrounding area. And before I referenced a tense, the aorist tense in the Greek, but this section in verse 8 is written in a different tense. It's written in something known as the present imperative tense. And so what Jesus is saying by using that tense is that this door is going to continually stay open. And that it's something that the church in Philadelphia needs to be continually doing is to go through that open door and be a missionary for Jesus Christ. Now, there are many excuses which the church in Philadelphia could have used. They could have said, but Jesus, we're not very a big church. And in fact, it's thought that they were the least numerically gifted church, the smallest church. They had the least amount of money. And they could have used several excuses as to why they were not going to go through this open door and be missionaries. But apparently they didn't use those excuses. Because there are still Christians in Philadelphia. And as we've seen through some of these other cities, if the people did not repent, if they didn't do what Jesus asked them to do, they would become no more. But there are still Christians, there is still a church in Philadelphia. And Jesus honored them. And Jesus tells them also in the scriptures that he has rewards for them. And the rewards call to mind their history and the background of the city of Philadelphia, what's happened to them. In verse 12, we hear about this first reward. He says, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar is... In God's temple, recall something that is, is permanent, that will be there. Unlike the temple in Philadelphia that was destroyed by the earthquake. No, Jesus is saying, my temple will be permanent. He then goes on in verse 12, if you're reading along, and says, never again will they leave it. This calls to mind the fact that people in Philadelphia, if they went to the pagan temples... During the day, they would eventually have to leave it at night because of those aftershocks, because of the earthquakes continuing. But Jesus says, in my temple, there will be a permanence and you will never leave it. He then goes on to say that part of their reward is that they will get, this is at the end of verse 12, that they will receive a new name. That's something, again, that the people in Philadelphia were familiar with because they changed the city or the name of their city from Philadelphia to New, New Caesarea to Flavius. So they were used to new names, but they kept on changing back. But here Jesus is saying, I will give you a new name which will be permanent. It will be my name. It will mark you as mine forever. And that's the rewards that are waiting for for this church in Philadelphia as they go through this open door and be missionaries for Jesus Christ. And I think the great takeaway for us as we sit here in the 21st century, specifically at Bethany Presbyterian Church, is this. I believe with all of my heart that God has given an open door to this church, to this community that surrounds us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. I believe we've been given an open door by being placed right here where we are. I believe we were given an open door when we got this great intersection right out in front of the church where people stop throughout the day. And maybe we could put a, a message of God's love, of Jesus' love for them right out there. We were given an open door through technology, which, you know, John, when he was writing this, could have never imagined. There's something out there called the Next Door app. And I believe that's served as an open door 
for the community to kind of come and help us and for us to help the community. There's such an open door here at Bethany Presbyterian Church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ into the world. And I know I've heard you and some people have excuses or reasons why you can't do it. You would say, but Jesus, we're too small. We don't have enough money. We really don't know how to do evangelisms. And the, and the people around here, they don't quite look like us. And maybe they're from different countries. I mean, we don't even have a permanent pastor. We have a for the time being pastor. But I still believe that we have an open door to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do that just by living it out everywhere we go. This week, I read a story based back in 1953. I know it was a long time ago, but it's still a great story. It's still a great illustration. Back in 1953, in the springtime of Chicago, it is said that a group of people were at the main Chicago train station because that's how people used to travel mostly by then in 53, still by train. And they were waiting for the winner of the 1952 Nobel Peace Prize. There's a welcoming committee and there were reporters and there were dignitaries for the city waiting for this great man. And the train pulled in that was carrying this man and a few minutes later he stepped out and he struck a great pose because he was six feet, four inches tall. It's pretty tall back in 1953. He had this great hair and he kind of looked out over everybody because he was tall and, and everybody was so glad that he came and people stepped forward and, and shook his hand and said, thank you for being here, thank you for being here. Well, as he was doing that, he was looking over the crowd. And at one point, he stopped shaking hands. He said, will you all excuse me? And he kind of made his way through the crowd of the, the welcoming and the committee and the people who were there to see him. And he made it, they watched, and he made his way over to an elderly woman who had gotten off the train in a different class. She wasn't riding in first class. And he could see that she was struggling with these two heavy pieces of luggage. And so he went over and asked her if he could help. He picked up her bags and he walked her over to the bus that she was going to take. He stowed the luggage overhead so that she didn't have to put the luggage up there by herself, got her situated safely on her bus, and then he came back to the welcoming committee, and as he did, he just apologized. He said, I'm, I'm so sorry, I just needed to do that. The man's name was Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the great missionary who was a doctor in Africa who brought modern medicine to Africa. And as he came back into the welcoming committee, one of the members of the committee turned to one of the reporters who was there to cover the story of this man's arrival. And he said, up until this time, I have never seen a sermon walking. What he meant was the man lived out the messages of Jesus. He walked them out. Well, I believe that we are called to be a sermon walking in our daily life. We are called to be a sermon driving. We are called to be a sermon shopping. We are called to be a sermon running. We are called to be a sermon playing golf. We are called to be a sermon in our book clubs, wherever it is. And we have an open door in this community. We need to ask ourselves, how can we serve this community? How can we walk through this open door, in essence, this gift that Jesus has given this church? And when we do, I'm not sure exactly what our rewards will be, but maybe they will be a revitalized church. Maybe they will be a church that makes sure that it is, it is here decades into the future. And it may be that we might not necessarily see those rewards, but we can trust that Jesus will carry them through just like a church in the South. I'm going to read the story of this church a little bit. It was a church that was dying. It's a church that I, I read about in this book called Growing Young. It's a study from Fuller Youth Institute, and, and Trevor and I are kind of going through a cohort with this. If you'd like to join us, you're more than welcome to do it. But in the beginning of the book, they tell about 
a church that was struggling. Let me read it to you. This is from one of their studies. It says, one of the teenagers in our study, Isabella, was changed because of 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Her church decided to live a new story. In the 1960s, the southern church was on the brink of shuttering its doors. But instead of going dormant, the congregation resolved to grow young. Now, we're not in the case of shuttering our doors. But friends, I want to be honest. We're not that far off either. We're not that different than this church, which was getting older. But this church decided to do something different. The church recruited Roger, a new senior pastor who valued young people and their families. Roger emphasized safe and appealing facilities for children and also hired staff specifically devoted to children, teenagers, and their parents. Under Roger's leadership, the church involved children, senior adults, and everyone in between in local and global intergenerational mission trips. The congregation worked together to help young people feel included and represented across all departments of the church. It was hard work, but eventually that effort led to growth as well as a long-term commitment to prioritize young people. Fast forward to 2014. Again, this was 50 years in the past that people decided to walk through the open door. Some of them would never see the rewards, but we're just about to read about one of those rewards. Fast forward to 2014. Isabella, a high school sophomore, found she had no place to go. Kicked out of her house by her drug-addicted mom, Isabella ended up wandering the streets of her town, looking for someplace safe to spend the night. Desperate, Isabella remembered Dale and Kathy, a couple who had already welcomed a homeless classmate of Isabella named Emily into their home. Isabella didn't know that Dale and Kathy followed Christ or that the couple was part of this church with a 50-year legacy of living out Scripture's mandate to care for all young people, including orphans. All Isabella knew was that Dale and Kathy had already said yes to Emily. If she was lucky, they would accept Isabella also. Dale and Kathy were overwhelmed with Emily. Self-employed and strapped financially, they felt stretched thin in every way, but they knew Isabella needed a family and had a strong hunch they could be a family for her. And they were. It wasn't always easy. Isabella sometimes was rude, sometimes was impolite. When she first started going to church, she barely talked to anybody. But slowly, the church continued to love her and changed her life. And that's quite a reward. Now, some people walked through that open door 50 years ago. They never saw the reward of Isabella. And sometimes that's the case when we serve Christ. We won't always see the reward, but Jesus guarantees it will happen for us. Friends, I truly believe that if we see ourselves as a missionary outpost into this community, that God can change this community, he can change this church, and he will change us. And I think that will be reward enough for us. Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, I pray for Bethany Church. I thank you for this church, the people who have come before, who have established this church, who have rooted this church in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, now, at this time, I believe that you are calling all of us to then be missionaries of a Jesus culture, of a Jesus language into this community. And Lord, sometimes we don't know what we're doing. Sometimes we're not even sure how to do it. But God, help us to the best of our ability to be a, a sermon walking. That this might be a church that truly changes people's lives. And whether it's next week or next year or in 50 years, Lord, help us to be faithful to you so that our reward might one day be you looking at us and saying, well done, 
good and faithful servant. Well done. And Lord, may that be reward enough for us. I pray this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now receive this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thank you.